Hi, welcome uh, to our audience. Welcome to our uh, to our panelists. Obviously, we have a, a interesting and and uh, tricky title for our session today. Let me introduce uh, who everybody is. We have Pekka Rantala from Business Finland. Welcome. We have Juliana Kost Koza from Qualcomm. Lucia Dakundo from TNO. Paul Adams from Nokia and Jeff Melanson from Unity, who came all the way from the US, I believe, correct? correct. Welcome. So, welcome to all of you. Um, what I'd like to do is, is a little bit go three times around our panel, but if you can also want to interact with each other, feel free at the same time. Um, we, we, let's try and capture what's going on right now. What's the immediate near future and then what do you think is, is coming in the, in the longer term? What's, what's essentially the vision? Um, so, um, Pekka, what do you see go happening right now uh, in Finland, where you are, and uh, all over the world? Where are we? So, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Pekka Randala, and I'm bringing you warm regards from Finland, home of 6G. <laughs> That's my, my openish, opening line. But anyways, uh, I'm heading um, a national program in Finland, uh, which is called 6G Bridge. And it's a national program focus on, focusing on uh, 5G advanced or the latter part of 5G and at the same time to prepare for the 6G era. So that program is lasting for four years till the end of uh, 26 and the committed funding from government pockets, so to say, is 130 million euros at least. And uh, so we are building the digital infrastructure of the future with, with the industry. And uh, what comes to metaverse and forthcoming 6G era, so we are basically contributing directly to three uh, kind of topical areas. So the computing part, what happens, for example, at the chip, chip level, at the edge, or maybe uh, in the data centers. And then the um, communication part, which is directly 5G advanced and uh, 6G kind of technology set. And thirdly, the sensing part. So IoT, industrial IoT, and joint communications and sensing part. So uh, it's uh, it's not a, a sprint; it's a marathon. And but the technologies uh, and the future is a very interesting one. So um, at the same time, uh, we are um, kind of we are having four goals in our program. So we are driving. Uh, ecosystem-driven collaboration with the national partners, international partners, partners, and international partners outside EU as well. And secondly, we are uh, preparing for the future business ecosystems. So that means engaging large company, large companies, deep tech SMEs or startups, and uh, foreign companies on board. Thirdly, we are cultivating key capabilities, so to say, the human skill sets of the key researchers and industry industry uh, experts in order to contribute to the future what we would like to have. And fourthly, we will build maybe the first world's first 6G test network or the first version of it. But lastly, I want to announce that next month during this last event, so the 29th of November in Helsinki, amazing things will be happening. So Finland will be, uh, be launching its own national strategy concerning metaverse so that strategy is uh, focusing on five areas so the technology enablement so that is uh, microelectronics and photonics future business ecosystems health how to engage uh, how to foster human health regarding mental health physical health and, and inclusion and fourthly how to engage citizens and lastly how to adapt those metaverse solutions and services to industry verticals. So that was it. Thanks. Wow, exciting. The first national metaverse strategy. Yeah. In, very interesting. Uh, Juliana, what's Qualcomm doing these days? 
Thank you so much and thanks for the invite to be here. I'm really excited to talk about the metaverse. Um, so during my explanations, I will not use the term metaverse. I will use the term virtual worlds like the European Commission has launched a couple of months ago, their strategy. So we are adopting this uh, wording into our strategy as well. Um, and I would like to give you just a brief overview what Qualcomm is doing. So, as you know, Qualcomm is an um, innovator and leading developer of 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, and future 6G wireless systems and technology. And over the past years, we've been expanding our portfolio into horizontal business models. Nowadays, you can find our technologies in smartphone, cars, and in the industrial environment. Um, we started working on the concept of virtual worlds um, several years ago um, by developing an XR dedicated chipset um, encompassing a wide range of virtual experiences on AR, VR and mixed reality. Um, we are currently expanding our R&D um, lab footprint in Europe. So we are seeing Europe as our XR hub. Uh, we hired um, high talented engineers in Spain, Netherlands, France and Austria who are working on R&D activities when it comes to, for example, gesture control, 3D mapping and um, meshing, as well as object tracking. Um, we are collaborating with a, with a wide range of industry partners um, and we've launched several projects um, across Europe, but for sure um, globally as well. But just to highlight a few use cases which are important because we see virtual worlds as an advantage for the society and for the industry because usually we only focus on the industry, but we need to talk about for example, social inclusion, network opportunities, training, etc. as well. Um, so, for example, Stellantis is uh, leverag leveraging our technology in their uh, training activities um, to collaborate with new hired employees. We showcased recently um, a cooperation with Lufthansa where they um, try to um, demonstrate the business class experiences to their customers. Um, then we have different projects in Spain with um, different schools bringing VR lessons to students so they can visit historic places um, with their glasses. Um, then we have a cooperation as well with the university, uh, university's hospital in Heidelberg and in Vienna. Um, so one of them we are, um, so our technology is helping the the doctors on um, newborn ventilation, which is very important in my opinion. And one more project is linked to um, remotely um, remotely uh, doctors, which are a kind of uh, working together with on-site doctors on um, children violation diagnostic. Um, just to name a few. Um, wow. This is really amazing what um, yeah, what technology can bring for for the society in general. Great. So you're not sitting and waiting for 6G, I guess, right? <laughs> no, we are not. We are that's, not. That's great. Lucia, from your point of view. Yeah, hello. So um, I work for TNO, which is the Dutch Institute of Applied Research. And in uh, my group, we've been working on both aspects. So um, in uh, telecommunications, but also since about 10 years, for what can be considered now the precursor of uh, metaverse. We started looking mostly from the communication point of view, so how to uh, enable remote communication. Uh, in recent years, uh, so first we started with, with VR. In recent years, especially during the pandemic, we also expanded that to, for example, help uh, having the elderly connected because during uh, the pandemic, you couldn't visit a lot of elderly people in the um, in the nursing homes. So we also looked at um, accessibility on how to uh, provide this type of remote connectivity um, 
a connection for um, elderly. And in, let's say, the last five years, we also looked about more um, hybrid uh, type of communication. For example, in a type of use case that we call expertise at a distance, which is that, for example, you are a person that needs expertise uh, and you don't have it and you can call in a remote expert. So you would see the remote expert in the AR while the remote expert will see your word in, in VR. So these are things that we um, are looking at for specifically for um, the metaverse, uh, but we are also looking at what would we need from the networks in order to realize use cases. So I. I believe that um, it's not that we are can be sitting here and waiting for 6G to happen, but we should be um, actually giving input to what we actually need uh, from 6G in order to enable uh, new use cases, new um, businesses. So that's that's where we are looking at a lot in my organization. That's very interesting. So giving the input to the technology people, right? Yes, indeed. Uh, I also forgot to mention we are also active a lot in standardization, both in the um, uh, mobile standardization, but also in MPEG. So in order to uh, give as input what we have been researching such that technologies can be standardized that contain what's needed. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Paul? Afternoon. Um, I work for Nokia and Nokia is not just the home of 6G, <laughs> which is in Finland as we're Finnish. It's also the home of 5G, of course. Um, who thinks Nokia makes mobile phones? Really? No, we don't. <laughs> we don't. We don't. We, um, you can buy a Nokia phone, i.e. a phone with Nokia written on it, but we actually license the name to a company called HMD. I always do that. I ask how people, an audience, and nobody put their hand up, which means you're either too embarrassed or you all did know that we didn't make mobile phones. Um, so Nokia, we are a builder of infrastructure um, and also software and what's really interesting about the metaverse for us right now is how it links with smart cities um, we're seeing a massive migration of people so currently about 55 percent of people globally live in urban centers by 2050 that's going to be 70 percent 70 percent of the world's population living in 600 cities globally that's a massive migration. Um, the other challenge with that is cities or big urban centers cover about 2% of the world's surface, but they consume 75% of the Earth's resources. That's a car crash in what we have today, right? So what's interesting is how are you going to make the city a better environment for the people living there? And we believe that if you think about smart, smart cities and the metaverse together, you can actually use the capabilities of the metaverse, specifically things like automation and planning um, and uh, you know, seeing how things would work as so a simulation um, using digital twins. You could create a digital twin of the city and you could test how things work if you change a road or change something in the power system or change something in the water system. And that's not as bizarre as you might think, because we already have digital twins of some of the biggest um, telecoms networks globally, or the biggest networks like, you know, AT&T or Orange, not those specifically, but those size of networks, digital twins already exist, and they are used to see how the network works, to see what happens if you put a different traffic metric in or if you change a router or whatever it might be. So it all already works. And if we think about the complexity of those networks, I don't know how many of you are telecoms people in the room, I am, but those networks are horrendously complicated. They're really difficult. And city networks have an additional complexity as well because networks in the city layer on top of each other. So one network in the city that runs traffic lights is not the same one that runs the street lights. And they're all vulnerable to attack, so a cybersecurity attack. 
what would happen in a big city if all the lights on the, all of the traffic lights turned green at once because some nefarious actor had got in there and attacked the city systems. So in, a, in an environment that, that it is that complex and interrelated, having a digital twin is a cracking idea and it would work really, really well for testing how the city works. And you can only do that in the metaverse. That's what's interesting to us at the moment. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeff, have you heard of digital twins? Are you waiting for 6G to do any or you're doing a couple now? <laughs> His microphone is not working, I think. All right. We're old, going old, old school. school. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> Somebody's hacking you. It actually fits <laughs> the, the background wall here. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about Unity Technologies for you, those of you that might not know us. So we're the largest real time 3D engine in the world. So 72% of mobile games are built on Unity. If you have a smartphone, I guarantee you, you have an app built on Unity. So. Thank you for your business. And uh, in addition to all of the work that we've done in building out the gaming sector and so on, we started building Digital Twins about 10 years ago. Uh, we've done about 1,100 Digital Twin projects in the last 12 months. So for the discussion that's happening today about should we wait for 6G, how many years away is it, it's here already. So most industries, regions of the world are already well in the, the development of this. Um, some examples to, to consider looking at, and we have many, you know, imagine doing 1100 digital twin projects. We have a few use cases we could go through today. Uh, Singapore's smart city infrastructure, definitely worth having a look at. That's built on Unity Technologies. Um, also, if you look at some of our airport digital twin models in terms of sophistication and integration of different technologies, Pretty remarkable, but what we are trying to do at Unity is move people off the sort of conceptual conversation of metaverse or digital twin or whatever, whatever, whatever other buzzword is spitting about there and focus more on direct ROI, value creation, and actual problem solving. Because these tools actually are very transformational and they're transformational today and they produce significant ROI. Uh, we're generally seeing five to 10x kind of return on investments on some of these technologies. As Paul was mentioning, if you imagine all of the segregated technologies and systems in a city, the ability to coordinate those in terms of environmental savings, better planning, better operational performance, better training, and then apply that to any industry, because you'll find that most industries are siloed. There's technology investment everywhere. It's not coordinated properly. So we are running highly, highly inefficient societies and industries. And so we're sort of stepping in, in, in our part on the, as, on the software side to build those solutions to make those things more effective. Well, thank, thank you very much. Um, let's move on to the near, to the immediate near future. What, what do you see coming? What are you working on for the next couple of years? Obviously, 6G is a little bit far further down the way. What, what should we be expecting to see that's a little different from today? Becca? So, thank you. So, um, currently, we are at the engine level. So, that means we can design currently in, in the 5G era, um, for example, design an engine, maintain it, train new people, onboard new uh, colleagues. But, the, uh, for example, what happens in the near future uh, 5G advanced era, we will move for, from that engine level to factory level. So real-time digital twinning with the updates of the, what the network infrastructure, including satellites, has to offer in order to model and in order to uh, that digital twin to affect the uh, uh -huh. physical environment. So uh, I would say uh, it's a reality, uh, but uh, of course, large-scale pilots, it, it takes time. But um, in order to achieve that, there has to be advancements regarding microelectronics, photonics, software, AI, in order to, for example, to meet the sustainable development goals. And, uh, but the business poten potential is huge. So we are talking about how many thousands of uh, billions of euros in the next 10 years to come. But uh, I would say that in the near future, we are at the factory floor. And the, and the digital winning of it. So from engine to factory. In, engine to in, factory. I like it. I, I wonder what's the next one, but okay, don't say it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Juliana, what, uh, what, what are you guys doing uh, in the near future? What should you expect from Falcom? Yeah, I can, I'm happy to share what uh, we are doing currently and how we are developing um, the next step 
actually. Okay. Um, so we want to accelerate the XR globally for sure. And we are investing more than $100 million into the Metaverse Fund. And in this context, um, we want to um, limit market fragmentation and want to offer an open interoperable ecosystem on a single platform. And that's why we've developed the Snapdragon Spaces platform where every developer and manufacturer can be part of it. So it doesn't matter if you have a company or if you are a developer sitting at home, um, you can be part of this platform and you can do your activities there um, to um, foster or to boost um, XR applications, which is amazing. And um, we are working with more than 80 companies together already. Uh, we are having a huge success in this one. And uh, we are constantly, and this is the interesting point, we are constantly adding new features, which means that we are giving the opportunity to the developers to help us in boosting it. So okay. boosting the virtual world. And um, just to name a few, we are working with Meta, we are working with Microsoft, Deutsche Telekom, Snap, Lenovo, etc. But this is what we from the industry side are doing. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah. Chia? Yes, so um, I think on one hand there are the developments in the hardware, for example, but especially uh, in my organization, we look at the software that runs then on top of this hardware. And let's not forget that networks are becoming programmable. So when I say about software, I also mean about the networks. Uh, one uh, element in the near future that I think is going to happen is uh, about AI and specifically in uh, dynamic management of networks that can adapt on to the application that runs on it. So for example, if you have um, um, yeah, a metaverse application running at a certain time and maybe have even people joining and leaving, uh, the network uh, could in the near future adapt to this and scale up or down some resources, some for example edge resources or maybe even bandwidth. So that's what we are working on right now and what I think will be uh, an important aspect in and the near future. I think that's, what, that's what Paul was talking about, right? Very dynamic management of networks, my yeah. personal passion. Yeah, got, <laughs> yeah we've, we've got a name for that actually. It's called Network as Code, yeah. and oh, wow. which we yeah, I know. The, yeah, we just the launched Nokia, it. The yeah. Nokia term, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is actually, um, um, I don't know how, how to describe this. Story. If you've been in the industry a while, these things kind of like circle around. Yeah. <laughs> and it was um, in a former company called Alcatel Lucent, which was acquired by Nokia in 2016, that was called application enablement. Mm -hmm. And it was all about exposing APIs at the edge of the network so that developers could develop services very quickly that would then run on that network as a kind of, um, I don't know what the word is really, kind of neutral infrastructure, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and network of code is the new thing that's, that's we've, we've put out there. But I think one thing, you know, let's be clear, the metaverse is here, right? This is not a future thing, it's here now. And I think it's just a question about how um, how you define it really. So my my, bo my boss, Rolf Werner, who heads of Europe, he was on stage early. You might have seen him using broadly the same narrative as me, um, who, who knew we were in coordination. Um, and he was talking about his son and how during uh, lockdown, he was playing games um, in the metaverse. And he made a friend playing games in the metaverse, which I didn't hear until lunchtime. And his son had never met this, this friend of his. He never met him. And, but recently, they met for the first time. They met in a McDonald's or something, right? <laughs> and it was the first time. He didn't know what they looked like. So the metaverse is already here. But what's interesting is, if I'm coming back to my smart cities thing, is the infrastructure that we're building now to enable the cities or to enable um, communities, so fiber to the home, 5G, you know, fixed wireless access, all of these technologies, we're, that's the infrastructure that the metaverse will need, the, the next generation metaverse. So 5G can, can do it, right? Because we, we're already there. But what 6G will bring is where everything is a sensor. So, you know, everything. Everything will be a sensor in the network. 
And that's how you build these really complex digital twins. But even the digital twins, complex digital twins are there now. We did a, um, a project with Lufthansa where we created digital twins of their um, of the of the engines for the um, airplanes, mm -hmm. and it's a way of detecting faults, and it's it's a massive productivity saving for them. Um, that's not necessarily a metaverse thing, but the, the point I'm making is that the technology is almost there for the next stage, um, and I think it's a really exciting time. I, yeah. mm -hmm. Wonderful, Jeff. What's coming? I'm officially going old school the whole time. Uh, further to what Paul said, just on that, in terms of our being in the metaverse, if you're interested, look up the Vancouver Airport. The solution that we built for Vancouver Airport actually tracks all of the airplanes on site, has transponder information for all the on site vehicles, as well as doing like traffic, integrating CCTV camera footage, and so on. Um, so I, I totally agree with Paul. Uh, we're already in the metaverse. We're probably in a crappy metaverse that will get infinitely better over time. Um, in terms of what's next, back to the question, uh, two things. So we're, we're doing a lot of work with the headset providers, as some of you might know, on the Apple Vision Pro, we're the software partner uh, developing that. So obviously spending a lot of time with the people at Apple on the sort of next uh, iteration of spatial computing. And then, you know, just pivoting back to what I said earlier about buzzwords, I think we're spending a lot of time with government and business leaders talking about the business case for this. Because, you know, there was conversation earlier today about the sort of the, the case for investment. We're seeing huge efficiencies on capital planning. So anyone who's deploying CapEx, and that would be government asset management, industrial use cases, and so on. Massive new revenue generating potential um, attached to sort of some of these new worlds that we're, we're building where this sort of the business model starts to defy gravity in terms of what you can do next. Ma huge operational efficiencies. We're, we're very inefficient. Our businesses, it's quite surprising. You go into great companies run by great smart people and you can find all sorts of inefficiencies. So we're actually wasting a lot of money, time, energy. Um, better environmental performance through development of digital twinning. And then on the workforce development components that were, were mentioned earlier, we're doing a lot of work taking our digital twin infrastructure and plugging that into post-secondaries, colleges and universities, industry upskilling, digital twinning of K-12 education and so on. So there's incredible opportunities for us to think much more dynamically about how to build this in an accessible, uh, inclusive way that is actually quite transformational for economies and societies. I think you've coined something because you said today's metaverse is crappy metaverse or something. I think we should call crappy it crappiverse. <laughs> crappiverse. That's where we are today. You We're heard in the it, this is not happening <laughs> on my panel. Next one. Go to the after one. <laughs> it's too awesome verse right <laughs> now. No, the next one will be the awesome verse. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We. we have 10 minutes, but we want to hear about the, the vision. The future don't scare people, please, because this is already worrying people already, especially this blend with AI. We had a good chat uh, at the opening session today. But what should we be looking forward to, uh, Pedro? In the so we will be moving from the factory level to the smart city level. So okay. there will be a broad-based, real-time updates of their network which are con directly contributing to the digital twinning of the city. So the network uh, in, that, in that case will be uh, either communicating or sensing things, whether those uh, mouses, people, cars, or uh, that up will be updated to the digital twin, uh -huh. uh, twinning of the city because the network will be acting as a radar. So, uh, will it take and, action? Yeah, in, uh, I have seen it in action. So, uh, okay. so, uh, but not the mouses. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and and maybe we could in the end of the next decade see early insights of the holographic, some kind of telepresence. But in my opinion, in my study, I have a kind of reason that the base case for uh, 6G metaverse is 10 gigabits per second, and the kind of um, medium rates would be 100 gigabits per second. But of course, the end customer's needs is the what the end requirements uh, would be finally, finally be. But in order to engage the citizens, consumers, industry, and all of us, they has to be open. They have, it, uh, the metaverse has to be open, reliable, inclusive, and trustworthy. So that's my key okay. takeaway. Yeah. Juliana, the future. Thank you. Um, so, 
I wanted to to uh, to mention or to add a smaller part on the network issue, but now sure. it has already been mentioned. Um, so, in my opinion, it is like the future will be everything will be connected as. Like, you will not see any boundaries anymore between the physical world, the digital world, etc. Um, but for that, we need, as you mentioned as well, the network. I mean, 5G millimeter wave could be a solution um, in in the way to, to 5G, uh, to 6G, for example. But uh, we would need to have um, the right regulatory framework in place as well. Okay. which will not be like a kind of over-regulation, but at the same time um, giving the opportunity to the industry to, for example, collaborate, to have like a platform of dialogue, um, to discuss certain aspects when it comes to cybersecurity issues as well. We haven't touched on this one, but I just want to mention the EIDAS regulation, for example, which will be important for the metaverse virtual worlds in the end as well. Okay. Um, so we need to find first the right framework or the right balance, and then we can proceed. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Chia? Yeah, so, yeah, it will be very nice if in the future we would have that this virtual world will be like the new internet. So have the same revolution that we had for the internet with, let's say, metaverse technology. So where they, they are uh, easily accessible and um, also how can I say that also the interface is easy and inclusive for everyone such that everyone can use them whenever they like, wherever they are, and they can connect with whomever they want at any given time. So that's what I think the future uh, will bring. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Paul, we have seven minutes to share between the two of you. Okay. <laughs> Just, do what do you want to talk about? Just, <laughs> or, or take the... we, we could do that karaoke set. <laughs> yes, do that. All right. Okay. Um, so I think I've probably, I, I mean, I have outlined what I think a possible future for the metaverse and smart cities is. Um, and you're quite right, we haven't talked about AI at all. However, you talked about 25 gig and that technology already exists. So, you know, if you want to buy some, come see me afterwards. We'll sort that up. Um, well, you'll finish, we'll give you a discount. Um, so, but what we haven't touched on, we haven't touched on AI. Please. And if you're in an automation, a situation where automation is so complex, such as in a smart city metaverse, then AI is going to be a big, a major component of that, particularly at the edge of the network. Um, so I think, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's lots of narratives out there at the moment about, you know, about AI and how, you know, we're all going to be murdered by killer robots, which is just silly, right? It's oh, just, no. it's just silly. You shouldn't right? worry about that at all. <laughs> no, it's just, just, it's just silly, right? It's just people. There's no movies people. about that. <laughs> no, yeah, there are right? Terminators and whatnot. But, and, you know, and those, and those views are generally put out in the media by people who don't understand the technology at all, right? But what we do need to see is we do need to see, and I think this was, I think it was your point, it's about we do need to see regulation. We need to see proper regulation, was it? We need to see proper regulation for AI. Um, and when you've got, you know, a huge database, one of the, one of the in interesting things about cyber attacks is, um, so I have a you know, passing interest in cybersecurity, is um, a lot of cyber attacks happen directed at um, healthcare. And the reason is that it's about value. It's about the value of the data. And if it, because if something has no value, no one's going to steal it, right? So if it, something has value, someone will at least try to get it. And there's a direct, there's a, there's a law called Paulson's Law, which is a, he's a hacker, and we, which actually describes that very closely. But anyway, but the point, so, so I think there's a, there's a cybersecurity angle which we need to consider, and that is actually, a lot of that is about how do we secure the data? And I don't think we're there yet. And I think if you've got, you know, 75% of the population living in 600 cities, there's a, there's a proliferation of data there. So we need to get much better at security. We need to get back much better at, um, at the regulation of AI, I think, so that everybody understands what it can do and what it can't do and what it should do and what it shouldn't do. Um, particularly as, you know, people try to weaponize, weaponize it, right? Yep. So, you know, I think that's the future I see, but I think it's a positive Thing because I think we're already aware of these problems. They're not unknown unknowns, are they? 
we we know what we needed to do, and I, I know, and I, I'm quite positive about that. Over to you. Four minutes. Okay, oh, four minutes. He's okay. generous. Excellent. He's generous. He is very generous. I thought we had eight minutes. I gave him half. <laughs> oh, I think it was seven, but oh, oh. it's now, Curse my now maths. three and a half. But that's good. <laughs> um, so I'm uh, my background's in disruptive innovation, and if you look at the history of new technologies, there's always fear mongering around what these things are going to bring to the world. Right, the printing press was going to destroy everything. Radio was going to destroy music. <laughs> like, we've we've had like successive panic attacks through human human history about new tools that were going to destroy us. And if we look back, we're going to find that most of those things ended up being very enriching. So. I would like the conversation to be much more positive and constructive in terms of how we look at this going forward, because I don't think we're going to be destroyed. On the AI side, if you don't have foundational digital twins in a digital strategy, it's very hard to deploy AI at an enterprise level and have it produce meaningful value. So just I'll, I'll put that out there. In terms of the positive vision for the future, um, I mentioned education and workforce development. With these digital twins, we have replicas of exact work environments where you can create unlimited, accessible, universal training for anybody, provided they have access to the internet. So what that means is for anyone who lives in the middle of remote nowhere and feels they have to move to this city or that city for jobs, we have the opportunity to create universal access to skilled trades in an unprecedented way. There are a number of applications of this technology that are so transformational if we're willing to release control of the past. Like we actually have ways of doing business, ways of running government, and we're very threatened by some of these new technologies. But if we look at these as kind of these universal playgrounds for creating meaning, they're pretty exciting. And I'm not talking about some weird avatar buying stuff on a, on a you know, whatever sort of visual representation you want, but more how do we take these tools and this new potential and reimagine how we run our companies, how we build societies, how we build inclusivity? Like it's very powerful. But um, I will also say, if you think of the industrial revolution, because we are in that type of sea change right now, imagine if you were a region that thought this was going to happen slowly and that you had 10 or 15 years to work on it to figure it out, where other regions were like, it's happening now and we're going to go for it. The risk is if you move too slow at this, from a global competitiveness standpoint, you're going to slip. So take it seriously, be positive and ambitious. And uh, I think there's lots of excitement in the future for us. I Thanks a lot. We, Thanks a lot. What a, what a great need. plug for my next session, no, for, the, <laughs> for the, the, the session about the Europe and the metaverse. So uh, if you're interested in this topic, uh, please, please join us. Well, I, I'd like to thank you all. I think you've given us, uh, you know, a good view and some hope and positive messaging. I do believe that this is a positive thing and it will be super disruptive. So I, I agree with you all. Uh, now we can open it yeah. to the audience for some questions. By the way, we asked our online audience uh, what do they think? Uh, if, uh, existing... My favorite questioner. Yeah, they, we asked if they think that existing metaverse solutions are a good product mm -hmm. and good uh, successful, you know, for the market. And some said yes, some said no, but two thirds said they've never been in metaverse. Have you been in metaverse, by the way? Have you? One? Two, three, four, five. So, okay, yeah. this is the. You're in it now. But, All right, but, we have a few that, minutes, uh, five minutes for questions. I see a hand here. Please be very concise. Oh, he will. <laughs> Hi, Dean Bubbly. Uh, I was uh, moderating a panel earlier. I'd like to ask the panel: What proportion of metaverse use do you expect to be indoors, and what does that mean for six G? Uh, so the. That's an interesting question, actually. It's an it's a interesting question. So, well, the, uh, no, really. I, <laughs> um, so, I think it's hard to put a percentage on it. But I think, so to the question that came on online that you just said a minute ago about people who've been in the metaverse, anybody who's played an online game with other people has been in the metaverse. So there's probably an education, a, a version of the metaverse. So I think there's probably an educational issue about what the metaverse actually is. And I think we do need to do that. Um, I, would, I would expect um, probably 50-50. And, a, and I, I think that because I think there, are, there will be interesting technologies outside and we're seeing them already. So 
um, we have use cases about how um, the metaverse or um, immersive technologies can be used in dangerous environments, such as in mines and in uh, various, uh, various other areas. Um, we don't think mines are dangerous, though they really are. <laughs> Sorry? No, <laughs> no mine isn't indoors. Um, so I, I, so I, I think it'll be an, it'd be an interesting mix, I think. Um, but I, and, but I, I think for, from a 6G perspective, with everything becoming a sensor, I think that will be mo the majority of that will be outside. I would have thought, but I would I would say it'd be pretty even. Um, let's give the opportunity to ask questions to somebody <laughs> else, if any. If not, you can continue your discussion for another three minutes, if you want. <laughs> well, I was just going to add, I, you know, proportionally hard to predict, but the the smart cities and smart industry work that we're already doing, like in the Vancouver Airport, we're tracking planes from a thousand kilometers out from the airport in, right? So in terms of outdoor activation, all the transponder information, all outdoors. So those examples, some of the energy companies, oil and gas companies we're using are entirely outdoors. So I, I think this notion that we're going to have more of an indoor application is, is fraught. 6G is going to be helpful for sure. It's not required to be building these foundational steps though, but I, I think you're going to see pretty, you know, you think of all of the smart city use cases, transit coordination, safety and security on streets, like it's, there's a ton of exterior um, requirement that's, uh, that's built around these things. Thanks a lot for that. Please. Actually, I think that there will be a bit of a majority indoors because let's be honest, where do we spend nowadays most of our time? Indoors. So I do think that if uh, immersive technologies and the metaverse actually reach the end users, we would have a slightly bigger majority indoors. And regarding your question, what does that mean uh, for 6G? Um, I do think there is already work already started in 5G on how to integrate mobile technologies with other types of technologies. So I would expect that at some point, um, the edges between um, mobile networks, uh, Bluetooth, um, Wi-Fi, they will be less and less and it will be a sort of unified type of network. That's what I expect. Yep. We have one short question here. Yes, hello, Uwe Bederode and Schwarz. Um, I have a question. Who will pay at the end for a 6G network that supports the metaverse in the rural area or in the wide area? Anyone? Uh, well, okay. Um, <laughs> it depends who's providing the service, doesn't it? Um, and and who um, who's receiving that service and do they want to pay for it, right? So that's... And, the, and monetization has been the challenge for all of these um, applications forever. So there's, there's a great example. We were, we were involved in a smart city project in Bristol, which is in the west of England. And um, one of the use cases we were testing was about um, air quality, so live air quality. So by putting sensors onto um, bus stops, you could actually have a live map of the quality of the air in the city, right? Who cares? Right? Who cares about that? Well. If you're, if you're the mother of an, or the father of an asthmatic child and you're low income and you need to use public transport to go to the supermarket, you probably care about that a lot, right? But would you be prepared to pay for it? Probably, well, possibly, but if you're on a really low income, maybe not. But the rub is the local authority should pay for it because if you maintain the health of that child, that creates less of a drain on the health service. So but building that, making that business case is difficult. But in today's world, you know, if we look about, if we think about 5G today, the people that are buying the 5G networks, unless they're private networks, are typically the service providers, right? Are we going to see the same model in 6G? I don't know. I mean, we might, you might see, I don't know, Google come in and decide that they want to become a service provider. I mean, who knows, right? I mean, the, the market's changing all the time, and we're seeing this convergence between 5G and uh, between um, enterprise, between IT and telecoms 
as well. So the, the whole model is changing. Uh -huh. Thank you for so much. I think we're done. But definitely thanks for all, all your views and all your uh, suggestions. And I hope everybody enjoyed the discussion.